Welcome back and thank you for joining us. Lesson number three, how to have victory over sin. This is going to be an interesting topic. It's going to be trying to do it as fast as possible. In 10 minutes, we're going to get those three main points. But keep listening because if you're having problems with your relationships, I believe this is going to help you. So carry on listening to the end of this video. Now, I did say at the end of the last lesson, number two, that we'd be doing Genesis chapter 3, verses 15, this lesson. I've decided for better logic that we do this lesson now, and in one or two lessons' time, we'll be doing Genesis 3.15. And you may be asking, Brett, this is lesson 3 or 4. We're still on Genesis chapter 3. When are we going to move on to the rest of the Bible? This will take 10 years. No. Once this is done and our foundations are correct, it's going to go much, much faster. You'll watch and it will enlighten us as to the backdrop of every single scripture that we read. There can be Bible study which you can come to wrong conclusions and I don't want to do that. So I want to rightly divide the word of truth. And that's why we're laying these foundations. You know, in the Roman Forum, we look at these columns and they stand there for thousands of years and how is this possible well look at that foundation those railings there are like waist high so that's over nine foot there of solid rock foundation and the reason why we have good foundations is good foundations will avoid this kind of problem in the future this lesson is going to be what is satan's strategy to make you fall how is he going to put his foot in front of you and trip you up so that we can fall if we understand his methodology it's going to really help us to overcome sin and temptations that he puts in our lives. Now, the thing that makes serpents very effective is their stealth. They lie undetected. And in an unsuspecting rodent or something comes along and boop, they catch it. So if you didn't see him, there he is over there. So this is their methodology is to lie in stealth to be undetected. Now, I see you. And when I see this guy here with the, with the light that comes from the Word of God, we can avoid him. I'll take a wide berth around this guy. So I call this the deception of undetection. I don't know if that's a word, but now it is, right? <laughs> and so to be aware of his attacks is going to be the key to overcoming sin in our lives. So we're going to be looking at three simple steps of how to identify Satan's maneuvers in our lives. So we're going back to Genesis 3. So what I want you to do right now is to look at this verse and highlight or underline or write on a piece of paper what jumps out at you. You did pause the video, right? Okay, let's carry on. So number one, he is more cunning than all the beasts of the field. So we need to know that we don't have an unintelligent foe. He is extremely studious in how we think, what we do, where our weak points are. Each and every one of us have vulnerabilities in our lives. He sows doubt over God's word. If you got that, fantastic. There you can see in other translations too, where he says, can it really be that God has said? Is it true that God has said? Has God really said? See those doubts? Now, the next verse. Pause the video again and have a look at this one. And what I'm picking up is, Satan is plainly contradicting God's word. Absolutely in your face. No, it's not like that. It's like this. He attacks the integrity and character of God. He says that God cannot be trusted. He's lying to you. And the result of that is the breakdown in the trust and the relationship between God and man. So pause the video for a minute and contemplate and meditate on this verse here and write down what you think is actually happening and how Satan is working and playing mind games with Eve at this point. Again, he's saying that God cannot be trusted. He is knowingly trying to deceive you. In other words, he's just saying that you will die in order to keep you from something. Have a look there. He says, For God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. So it's clearly he's saying, yeah, God has told you you will die. But God knows better than that. He's just lying to you straight out, up front. He's just saying that in order to keep you from something. That is a real attack on the integrity of God. And he says, uh, basically, God doesn't want you to have special powers that he is holding and restricting you from having. He wants those powers simply for himself. 
and he doesn't want any competition. And so he's made up this lie that, well, if you eat of it, you're going to die. But that's not really the case. What's really going to happen is you're going to have powers that make you like God. Hmm. That sounds very New Agey, right? That's key to most of the New Age movements, and even it's coming into Christendom today and Christianity, where people are starting to say things like, you can be God. Bless this young lady's heart. She put this picture up on Unsplash, and thank you to Unsplash for all the, the free pictures we can use. But I'm sure she's a very nice person. God said, you shall surely die. Satan says, you shall not surely die. Oh, so he's planting that seed there, right? And then it transfers through the ears into a mind, and that's the temptation. Temptation isn't sin. Temptation is temptation. It's not yet sin. But when sin germinates and it gains root in our minds and it grows, then it causes action. Sometimes a sin might just be something in the mind, and other times it'll be manifested in action. But I'm saying to you here that this sin, which was the doubt over God and God's character, caused a relationship breakdown between God and man. And that's where the sin was. I'm not saying that eating the fruit wasn't sin, but I'm believing that sin happened way before that fruit came to her lips. It was actually the breakdown in trust, the breakdown in relationship and thinking evil of God. That's where the sin really started. And we read Paul says the same thing. He says, whatsoever is not of faith or of belief, it is sin. If you can remember this picture in any of your relationships, Satan is the wood chopper. He is the woodsman. He is trying to split wood. He's trying to divide and conquer. He's trying to come between you and your spouse. He's trying to come between you and God. He's trying to come between you and your children. He's trying to come between your children themselves. And he's even trying to, try, trying to come between friends and communities. And so if we're wise to that, we're going to say, Ah, I see you, Satan. You're not going to trip me up. And we're going to see more about this in the next few minutes. So then what happened as a result? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. So that was the result. Now have a look at the three steps that are taking place here. She saw that it was good for food. That's lust of the flesh, taste buds and endorphins and things. Lust of the eyes. And the pride of life, to make one wise. You see, it would, it would stroke the ego. It would, it would help one to progress in life and to become higher and higher and higher, just as Satan always wanted to do. And John says the exact same thing. He sums it up in the three same ways. He says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. More question, if it's of the world, where did it come from? It came from the, the God of this world, which is Satan. And so all of these things here are key in Satan's arsenal to get us to sin. It begs a question, though, friends. Um, what are we watching? What are we watching? Should we be watching secular TV to the extent that what we do? There are so many things that if Jesus was sitting next to us, he probably would leave the room, right? So that's a good gauge to kind of use. What should we be exposing ourselves to? Because we are putting ourselves in temptation's way. We are simply then walking in the woods blindfolded and we're going to run into a lot of trouble. We're not going to see the traps that Satan has when we put ourselves in his way by watching things which totally from Hollywood are applying to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. That's exactly the heart of every single Hollywood movie. And this is the three-pronged attack that Satan used in the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Remember, it was make these rocks into bread if you are the Son of God. So it's tempting as pride. If you are God, then make this into bread. And he was starving by that stage. He had 40 days. And so if you look at each of those three temptations of Jesus in the wilderness, they're all applying to, or well, Satan is appealing to the nature of man that Jesus was in the flesh that you and I have. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, he says, 
You are still carnal. You haven't been converted yet. You need to become spiritual, not carnal. Carnal is fleshly. So you are the old man. You're still going, you're still being driven by fleshly lusts and desires. For where there are envy, strife, divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving as mere men? <laughs> as mere men? Yeah, that's how we begin our Christian life, but that's not how we should end our Christian life. We need to be changed by the, by the renewing of our mind. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. So sin causes relational breakdown. This is at the heart of what Satan does. So Jesus used the same approach in avoiding sin and overcoming sin is that he was watching for attacks from the devil all the time. And he's like, ah, I see you. I see you. You're not going to get me. I see you. And so here he says, he turned to Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense for me or to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. In other words, you are not spiritual but you are carnal and you're trying to make me think of carnality. You're trying to make me selfish and thinking about myself. But I am God and I want to be like God the Father. And I am not going to fall for your temptation to make me think of carnally, think of self and not go down the walk to the cross. Because that is the spiritual thing and I want to do the spiritual thing. But can you see how, how Jesus was looking out for Satan's attacks all the time? And therefore, we need to do the same thing. We need to be on the lookout all the time, looking for where he is. So when it comes to relationships, when somebody in our life says something that offends us, why are we offended? Mostly we're offended, 99.999. In fact, let's just say 100% of the time we're offended because it affects our ego. We feel attacked, we feel discounted, and we feel offended, right? And it's our ego that is making it, oh, they've said this about me. It's like, whoa. So it's our pride has been affected, and it's all about self. And if we can see that as that wedge that's trying to separate me and my spouse or me and my friend or me and my children or whatever it might be, we can say, ha-ha. I see what Satan's trying to do. And you can go to your spouse and, or your friend and you can say, listen, I think what's happening here is what you've just said to me is starting to become like a wedge between you and me. And do you mind if we just pray about that? And I forgive you, but I just want you to know that's what's happening here. So, you know, and if, and if spouses, if marriage partners had to do that, you'd take care of most of the problems immediately because nobody really wants to fight. But it's what's... More important at that point is generally our ego, and that's what leads to a fight. So I hope that will help you in your relationships. Now, clearly, as I said in the beginning, the only way we're going to overcome sin is by God's help and with God's strength, not on our own strength. But it is important to keep our eyes open because you can have all the armor in the world, but if you don't have your eyes open, there's no ways that you can fight, right? So you do have to have your eyes open, and that's the point of this lecture here was to identify the methodology that Satan uses to try and trip us up. So in summary, friends, Satan's intention and his motivation is to break down relationships. He's an absolute sad sadist, and he hates people. He hates harmony, and he hates peace. And that's how he operates. And he uses suspicion and he uses our pride and our ego. But the three things he used against us individually is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And the Christian walk of conversion is to put to death the old man who walks according to the flesh and the new man who's the man who's led by the Spirit, by the renewing of our mind. And as God puts his laws in our hearts and writes them upon our minds, we will walk according to the Spirit. We are led by the Spirit and these become less and less powerful over our lives. So let's not fuel the flames. Let's not put gasoline on the fire by submitting ourselves to watching worldly entertainment. And all of these things here, I hope, will help you in overcoming sin. Right, and now our next lesson, number four, will be looking at Satan and where did he come from? Who is this guy? Who is the serpent that was causing all the trouble at the beginning of this planet and still does today? Where did he come from? Why is he around? And what's the deal there? So if you want to prepare, read those passages in Isaiah and Ezekiel, and I'll see you in the next lesson.